And welcome to the show! It's the last show of 2021 and we're reading Aristophanes for today. I hope Santa Claus came. Happy Christmas, Merry New Year. Well, one of the most serious challenges to learning is, of course, that we do not know what it is we do not know. Lest this point sound condescending, I'm going to frame it here as a confession. The first time I read any Greek drama, I was 23 and teaching AP high school students. So Sophocles' Antigone was the play. I don't think I got it much at all. It seemed kind of boring. And the next time I did read any Greek drama, I read the whole Oedipus cycle, maybe when I was 23, 24, maybe even later than that. And I still didn't really get it. But now I thought I got it. It wasn't until a couple of years ago that I finally read Aeschylus' Orestia trilogy, and that's when I finally felt like I understood, you know, that there was something more to know here in all this about the Greek drama, something important. Then I read a few of Euripides' plays, and things started to come into focus. Uh, But last week, I finally read Aristophanes' play, The Frogs. That's that's what this video is going to be all about. That's the whole sort of uh, focus of this show. And to me, it was like a personal revelation. I finally understood what it was that I hadn't known while I was reading all of those Greek dramas sort of building up to this. So in this video, I'm going to try to give you a sense of what, like, I think I was missing all along. But my real aim is to convince you that, A, you can probably read all 27 or 30 existing plays from that period. It's not a big commitment. And B, you probably aren't getting the full effect if you read fewer than like 14 of these plays. I mean, you really have to sort of commit to doing a lot of them in order to get what's really going on here. And it's worth doing, okay? So, okay, what is it you gain undertaking, you know, a 40-hour reading project like this? I mean, that's about how long it would take you to read 14 of these plays. My sense is that all of your learning about ancient Greece is sort of empty talk until you really understand what there is to learn in these plays. And then if you learn it, you become like a time traveler, no longer a mere historian or anthropologist studying them from the outside, but like a true understander of Athens in the 5th and 4th century BC. Okay, before I lose you, just consider that this is a manageable learning project. Like 2022 is coming up, great year to commit to something like this. You've got basically four playwrights, Okay, that's it. And here, I'm going to give you a summary organized chronologically from earliest to latest. So first, Aeschylus. Aeschylus is supremely dramatic in a very formal way. He's serious, mythological, and his lines come in an almost prophetic manner sometimes. And we can compare him here, as I'm going to do, comparisons with like movies in the American tradition or the Western tradition. Compare him to Cecil B. DeMille, so the Ten Commandments, movies like that, like where there's serious things happening, high drama, you know, serious acting, not a lot of jokes, uh, and so on. So that's Aeschylus. Then comes Sophocles. Sophocles is also serious, and in fact, he kind of deepens the inner dimension of his characters. So his themes become more complex, which means that he kind of catalyzes introspection in viewers, I think. So you can compare Sophocles to to directors like Hitchcock or Fellini, maybe. And then Euripides, who comes a generation later. Now we're getting sort of a jaded director, probably a result of the anxiety of influence. He's very aware of Aeschylus and Sophocles and others, you know, who preceded him. There's irony in his language, almost like it's his native language. He introduces mockery of the gods. And maybe we can compare him to somebody like Stanley Kubrick. And then finally, Aristophanes, who shows up sort of just as the golden age of Greek high tragedy is ending, and he gets called a comic for that reason. And so you do find in in Aristophanes scatological humor, drugs, but there's also a kind of visionary, surrealist element. There's always a meta element in Aristophanes. And you can compare him to somebody like Michel Gondry, maybe. One of these sort of, I don't know, like sort of theory film people, right? So that's that's just a rough schema, but I think it's probably helpful in understanding what's going on with these tragedians and 
uh, and dramatists if you haven't read them before. The comparison to movies and their directors is key to what I'm doing here, but don't get bogged down by my particular examples. I'm not a film snob, and I'm sure there are more perfect comparisons. But the key point is to see the general movements in movie making from 1940 to 2020, and then to think what it would be like for future people, 2400 years from now, to have about 30 movies, let's say, total, from only four or five directors in our time, in, like going back to 1940, let's say. Okay, so see, I mean, most people, even most of my esteemed subscribers, have read maybe only one, maybe two Greek plays. And the problem with this is exactly the same problem future people would have if they only watched one of our movies, say, The Shawshank Redemption. If, they, if that was all they watched as a way of understanding America in the 20th century. See, I argue that watching just one or two of our movies would be like utterly insufficient and frankly terribly lazy. And let's say someone majors in, you know, some future person majors in classical era American history 2400 years from now, but still he only watches four or five of the surviving 30 movies. I mean, this seems terribly lazy to me and insufficient, but I think it's pretty common now, even among classicists, you know, as long as they're not specializing in the tragedies, they will only read four or five of these tragedies, which is stupid. It's like you're trying to know these people, read these existing, surviving, extant 30 plays. The problem with merely dabbling is that you don't have enough exposure to begin to appreciate the evolution of movies as a genre, right? And what I'm saying here is that it would be extremely silly. It would be actually, it would be exactly as helpful and fair to what's really going on with movies and American culture to say that like DeMille, Hitchcock, and Kubrick were tragedians and Gondry is a comedic dramatist, right? Which is what they say about Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides as tragedians and then Aristophanes as a comic. But that's terribly reductive. In fact, I think it would be better to conceive of all four writers as participating in this like evolving form of the stage play and to try to understand how their innovations and departures from one generation to the next reflect and potentially reveal to us a shift in zeitgeist, which is a shift in the mindset of the people, right? See, when you're a global homo citizen and progress is your god, you have to conceive of things in terms of progress. So you're bound to say that whatever is most recent is generally best. But could someone at the end of history prefer Aeschylus, that is Cecil B. DeMille, in spite of the fact, or maybe because of the fact, that they're so earnest, so serious, so high-minded? In Aeschylus's plays, the gods remain distant, mostly offstage, suffused with sacredness. It's only in Euripides that the gods can be played by mere mortals, presumably because there's been a collapse in faith among the Athenians in the 50 years between the two poets. When Dionysus appears in Euripides, he's generally something of a dandy, and he's as often the butt of the jokes as he is the jester. The general decrease in formality and sanctity between the time of Aeschylus and the time of Euripides is remarkable, and we see the introduction of things like sex and curse words and drugs, nonsensical violence, special effects. It mirrors almost exactly the shift we all know took place in Hollywood between It's a Wonderful Life and Elf. And it happened just as quickly. The Orestia won first prize in 458 BC. And then Euripides, Bacche, premiered in 405 BC. So we're talking 53 years. What, which, by the way, so that's one year after the playwright himself died. He finished the Bacchae, and then he died, and then they performed it for the first time in 405 B.C. And it was 405 B.C. when Aristophanes won first prize for his play, The Frogs. The play is relatively easy to summarize. It's about Dionysus feeling dissatisfied with the state of Athenian tragedy, deciding to go to the underworld to bring back Euripides. Dionysus brings along a slave named Xanthius, and the duo are sort of a forerunner version of Don Quixote and Sancho. Good times, you know. 
Before they leave, they meet up with Heracles to inquire how to get to Hades without getting stuck there. Because Heracles' first examples are just like, you know, the tower down by the city center, climb up to the top of it and jump off, you know. I mean, this is a comedy, right? But anyway, um, then there are some very silly scenes where Dionysus is dressed as Heracles for the trip to the underworld, but then Xanthius starts complaining about carrying his bags and having it difficult, and so Dionysus offers to switch with him, leaving the slave looking like Heracles and Dionysus looking like the slave, which of course leads to, you know, all manner of silliness, some ladies throwing themselves at Xanthius and some funny moments where he tells Dionysus to shut up and carry the bags and, you know, and so on. There's a funny moment just before they leave for Hades where Dionysus sees some medics carrying a corpse and he speaks to the corpse, asking it to carry the bag, you know, down to Hades for him. And the corpse actually sits up and haggles over the price and then refuses. So we're talking like very slapstick, silly stuff here. Now as Dionysus crosses the lake to get to Hades, we get the first scene involving the frogs of the title. It's the standard Greek chorus. Uh, they kind of march up, but they're dressed out in all green and, you know, green tights and saying, brekekekex, coax, coax, over and over again, which I guess is the croaking sound. And they're sort of engaging in a mock debate with Dionysus, who gets pretty annoyed pretty quickly with their whole act. And this is all taking place in the form of a musical, you know, because, like, that's how the chorus portions of these plays work. And so it's become now very slapstick, Broadway-style, springtime for Hitler romping, right? And when they do finally arrive in Hades, Xanthius messes around pretending to see monsters. Dionysus reveals his effeminate nature, like hiding between Xanthius' legs, etc., cowering. After a short interlude, they meet the chorus again, but this time, the chorus is dressed in all white, and they represent the Dionysian initiates. They string a song, they, sorry, they sing a song about dancing, and they chant, Iakos, oh, Iakos, and then their leader steps forward and delivers an unexpectedly serious monologue. This is where I think Aristophanes really earns his reputation. Basically, he has captivated his audience at the beginning of the play with some totally, <clears throat> you know, surreal special effects and jazzy, comedic, musical numbers. And then, the leader of the chorus, dressed as a Bacchic initiate, straight from the fields of Eleusis, steps forward and says, like eyeballing the audience, says to them, quote, All now must observe the sacred silence. We ban from our choruses any whose brain cannot fathom the gist of our wit, whose hearts and feelings are dirty, who has never witnessed and never partaken in genuine cult of the muses, who knows not the speech of bull gobble Kratinos, who knows not the Bacchic fraternity, who laughs at cheap jokes that should not have been made, who writes such stuff at the wrong time, who stirs up sedition, dissension, and hate, who does not like the Athenians, who hopes to make money out of our quarrels, and lights them and fans them to fury, who holds high office and then takes bribes when the city is tossed in the tempest, who sells out a ship or a fort to an enemy, smuggling our secret intelligence from Aegina to Epidauros like any goddamn tax-collecting Thoricon. And it goes on like this <clears throat> for another half a page, you know, calling out all scoundrels, degenerates, usurers, traitors, even the people who are like smuggling secret intelligence it's very, it feels very 20th century. It's actually a little difficult to get a feel for how the audience themselves would have received this speech, dropped as it is right in the middle of their otherwise rollicking comedy. When the chorus joins in to, to sing again, they're no longer joking. They resume in the form of a prayer to Demeter, saying, Demeter, mistress of grave and gay, stand by now and help me win. Protect this chorus. It is your own. Let me in safety all this day. Play on, play on and do my dances. Help me say what will make them grin. Help me say what will make them think. Help me say what will make me win in your festival today. And wear the victor's garland. 
I mean, remember in the early plays of like Aeschylus and Sophocles, the chorus sort of stood in for the common voice of the NPCs in the town. But in this play, you know, first they're the frogs in the underworld, then they're Dionysian initiates, and they're this weird sort of like meta voice of Aristophanes himself, basically, you know, who hopes to win the annual drama festival thing, right? And to add to all of this, the body and titillating lines sprinkled in with the chorus's more plot-driving lines. For example, Aristophanes at one point has them sing, I saw a sweet little girl in the crowd down there. As she leaned forward, her dress, I swear, bust open a trifle, and I was happy to stare at a bosomy eyeful. I mean, this kind of thing feels a little cheap, because you can imagine how directly it plays to the audience. I mean, it's almost interactive, this play. It seems to aim to entertain now, more than to edify, as it did, I get the sense, when Aeschylus was at the helm. But am I blaming Aristophanes here? Not at all, because everything that's happening here is actually a setup for what's to come. Dionysus and Xanthius do some switching of clothes and identity again, and it certainly does call attention to the nature of acting and masks and costumes and identity, all very intentionally. Very meta, again. Eventually, they get in some trouble when they run into a guy named Iacos who has beef with Heracles. Remember, Xanthius is dressed up as Heracles, but Dionysus then steps in to try to argue that he's the real god here, and Iacos can't exactly tell, so he ties them both up and starts to whip them. Calling their bluff, Xanthius says basically like, yeah, the one who isn't a god will yelp, then you'll know which of us isn't a god. His plan is that he's hoping that Dionysius's effeminacy shines through. So the whipping begins. Xanthius tries his best to bite his tongue and pretend to be a god, you know, even encouraging round two and three with the whip. I mean, it's all very funny and ridiculous, but it also shows just how far the gods have fallen in Greek drama in the 50 or so years between Aeschylus and Aristophanes. The chorus steps in again to settle things down, and again the leader steps forward after a bit of song to deliver a seemingly serious speech to the audience. Listen to this. You're going to think this is fascinating. <clears throat> again, the year is 405. The Peloponnesian War is finally drawing to a close. Euripides died last summer. You know, that's sort of the scene. And the leader of the chorus says, quote, We've been thinking much of late about the way the city treats all the choicest souls among its citizens. It seems to be like recent coinage as compared with the old currency. We still have the ancient money, finest coins, I think, in Greece, better than the coins of Asia. Clink them, and they ring the bell, truly fashioned, never phony, round and honest every piece. Do we ever use it? We do not. We use this wretched brass, last week's issue, badly minted, light and cheap, and looks like hell. Now compare the citizens. We have some stately gentlemen, Modest, anciently descended, proud and educated, well on the wrestling ground, men of distinction who have been to school. These we outrage and reject, preferring any foreign fool, redhead slave, or brassy clown, or shyster. This is what we choose to direct our city? Immigrants? Once our city would not use one of these as a public scapegoat. That was in former days. Now we love them. Think, you idiots. Turn about and change your ways. And again, man, like, I would give anything to time travel to see how the audience reacted to this. I mean, were they booing and hissing? Or did they support the reactionary voice, sort of shining like a beacon in the middle of an otherwise clearly fallen comedy? Anyway, this brings us to the main action of the play, which is, I mean, remember, they're down in the underworld among the souls of the dead. This, the central plot now becomes to decide whether Dionysus should rescue Euripides, who just died IRL last summer, or Aeschylus. And following my own schema here, this would be like if you know Wes Anderson made a movie where like Alec Baldwin went down to the underworld and tried to decide whether to resurrect Cecil B. DeMille or Stanley Kubrick. The play can't help but become entirely self-referential from this point forward. Dionysus had originally come looking for Euripides, but when he hears him arguing with Aeschylus, the question presents itself, who shall be brought back to save Athens? Xanthius immediately suggests Aeschylus is the superior writer. 
And Iacos, who has made his peace with the duo, chimes in. He says, quote, <clears throat> When Euripides came down, he exhibited before the toughs, the sneak thieves, and the pickpockets, and the safe crackers, and the juvenile delinquents. And there's a lot of that in Hades. And they listened and thought he was the cleverest writer. So what you can hear it here is a subtle criticism against the more modern writers. Unlike Aeschylus, who appealed to what was noble in the audience, the modern writers, like Euripides, pander and make a circus and generally appease to the degenerate tastes of an uneducated or undereducated audience. But of course, remember, it's Aristophanes who's writing all of this, and if there ever was a play that pandered to the audience and gave them the red meat they wanted, the frogs has to be that play. Soon enough, Euripides, who, again, just died in real life, and Aeschylus are brought on stage. Pluto and Dionysus sit between them, ready to judge. Euripides begins by saying, I won't give up the chair, so stop trying to tell me to. I tell you, I'm a better poet than he is. Then Dionysus says, you heard him, Aeschylus. Don't you have anything to say? And the next line goes to Euripides, who says of Aeschylus, he's always started with the line of scornful silence. He used to do it in his plays to mystify us. And this is what I mean about self-referentiality. This is the kind of line that appeals to the audience's already quite sophisticated inside track knowledge about Greek drama. Basically, Aeschylus behaves in this debate in a way that reflects the character of his plays. He plays the straight, serious man, who would be played by that guy who plays the old man in succession, while Euripides seems to be much more ironic and disrespectful and playful. For the next 20 pages or so, the two great tragedians duke it out verbally to win the argument over who is the better dramatist. Euripides at one point claims that he made the drama democratic, as soon as he says it, Dionysus leans over and whispers to Aeschylus, You'd better let that one pass, old sport. You never were such a shining light in that particular line of thought. And what this means, of course, is that Euripides' plays bring the gods down to human level. They use natural conversational dialogue. It's like the difference between watching a Shakespeare play and a Brad Pitt movie. Boasting, Euripides says, I staged the life of every day, the way we live. But the interesting point here is that he seems confident that that was the way to make plays, that was the right move, you know? Whereas Aristophanes, writing sort of just after Euripides, writing this play, feeding Euripides in this play his lines, does not seem so certain about that. In fact, he has Aeschylus hit back in the next section and criticize Euripides for this attitude about de democratizing tragedy. So Aeschylus says, that's what he's begun. What hasn't he done? His nurses go on propositioning others. His heroines have their babies in church or sleep with their brothers or go around murmuring, is life life? So our city is rife with the clerk and the jerk, the altar baboon, the political ape, and our physical fitness is now a disgrace with nobody in shape to carry a torch in a race. I mean, how about those images, right? And like the argument that's implied is that our city is overrun with clerk, he means like, you know, the anti-meritocratic bureaucrat, and jerk, and the altar baboon, you know, the Zio shill Americanized pastor at level up church or whatever, and the political ape. All this, Aeschylus says, because of Euripides' unwillingness or inability to steer us toward ideals to appeal to the higher faculties, and so on. And I mean, frankly, like this is why I make my kids watch the Ten Commandments and Jesus of Nazareth and movies like that, rather than watching the latest Seth Rogen spoof. Continuing his criticism, Aeschylus shows that all of Euripides' iambics can be amended by the phrase, lost his little bottle of oil. This doesn't sound funny as I summarize it, but Aeschylus is actually devastating here asking Euripides to quote his own lines. So Euripides conjures up some of his own lines from his own plays, stuff like this. Quote, 
There's been no man who's had good fortune all his days. For one was born to fortune, but his goods are gone. One born unhappy. And then Aeschylus tags it with, lost his little bottle of oil. He's thinking in terms of meter, right? Like he can finish the line with, lost his little bottle of oil. This part of the play almost certainly would have had audiences laughing, which is uncomfortable because, you know, they're laughing at Euripides, who, remember, just died last summer. So the joke, you know, is like too soon, right? Anyway, Aeschylus continues mocking the language of Euripides. He says, watch, I'll show you. Somebody bring me a liar. And then he says, wait, no, don't. What's the use of a liar for this stuff? Where's that girl who uses oyster shells for castanets? Hither, Euripidean muse. And then the stage direction says, a scantily clad girl comes on. Aeschylus bows to her with mock ceremony. Dionysus starts eyeballing her. He says, so that's the tenth muse, is it? Well, she ain't no Sappho. That's a man's woman if I ever saw one. Funny. And then Aeschylus reads a few lines of Euripides, quits reading those lines in disgust, and says to Dionysus, just look at that line. And Dionysus, still looking at the girl, goes, I'm looking. And Aeschylus says, and look at that one. He's talking about Euripides' lines, but Dionysus goes, I'm looking, looking at the lines of the girl. So the slapstick burlesque comedy continues, and we have to imagine that it pleases the crowd, right? But, again, interestingly, ironically, at the same time, Aristophanes, the playwright here, seems to point us back to Aeschylus as the greatest of tragedians. When they finally bring out the scales to weigh the verse line by line, the result is that Aeschylus wins. Some discussion of how to save the city ensues. For example, Dionysus asks, Well, Aeschylus, what is your view? And Aeschylus replies, First, tell me this. Which men is Athens using? Her best? Dionysus says, Her best? Where have you been? She hates them like poison. Aeschylus replies, Does she really like her worst men? And Dionysus says, She doesn't like them. Uses them because she has to. As I was reading that part, all of this started to feel familiar and relevant to me in America in the 21st century, and I began to be able to imagine myself there in the audience watching that whole show. It's a real sobering moment when Aeschylus says, they, or like you, he's talking to the audience, they shall win when they think of their land as if it were their enemies, and think of their enemies' land as if it were their own that ships are all their wealth, and all their wealth, despair. In other words, this country isn't yours anymore. Your enemies took it over. Wake up. Your wealth is a trap. Find your weapons again, basically, right? We're, I mean, not to Fed Post, but this I'm quoting Aristophanes. When Pluto gives the concluding speech of the play, he says, Go forth rejoicing, Aeschylus, go. Save us our city. By your good sense and integrity, instruct the foolish majority. And Aeschylus signs off saying, I will, and while I'm gone, let Sophocles have my chair, but never let that fake-ass poet Euripides claim my title again. And that's pretty much it. That's the end. Uh, the whole thing is like some strange fever dream. It's maybe comparable to something like being John Malkovich, you know, that kind of comes closest to the sort of narrative Aristophanes puts together here. To my earlier point, though, you just wouldn't be able to understand or appreciate all of this if you weren't already deeply familiar with Aeschylus and Euripides. So just imagine some future historian watching only being John Malkovich, the one movie he watches from the American period, you know? There's no way he could understand American culture around, you know, 1940 to 2020 from watching just one movie. It's impossible, right? <clears throat> hey, thanks for listening. Support me on Patreon if you like what you're hearing and seeing. The link is in the description. Uh, for those of you who are already subscribed, concerning the secret streams, our next one is technically due to be held on December 31st, 2021, which is New Year's Eve. So I think I'm going to make the executive decision of putting it off by a week, and then we'll decide on like January, what would that be, 7th or whatever, if we want to have like a makeup week meeting or just get on the new cycle in the new year. Anyway, Happy New Year, Merry Christmas, thanks for listening, talk to you next time on The Godward Show. Bye-bye.